Hi everyone and welcome back to the North Carolina Redistricting Leadership Program. Today we will be doing our deep dive into the 2011 redistricting process. Um, so this is going to be a real deep dive. It's for everyone who wants to nerd out about redistricting a little bit with me. Um, and so we will be working through it in this way. We'll go into why 2011 was special in itself. Um, who was in charge of the process in 2011, who drew the maps in 2011. Um, we'll talk about one of the most controversial aspects of the 2011 process in North Carolina, which is what I'm calling the so-called VRA or so-called Voting Rights Act districts. We'll talk a little bit about public hearings, um, and then we'll talk about the very abbreviated process itself that happened, and then we'll end up with some key takeaways. So what made 2011 special? Um, just to set the tone, I'm going to read this quote to you from Representative David Lewis. It's a quote that you've probably heard before if you are interested in redistricting, and I think it really gives you a sense of what the attitude was in 2011. Um, so I propose that we draw the maps to give a partisan advantage to 10 Republicans and 3 Democrats because I do not believe it's possible to draw a map with 11 Republicans and 2 Democrats. So one of the things that was so um, different about 2011 was that the level of gerrymandering, technical expertise, and sophistication was just at a level that had never really existed before. Um, there was new software, there was a lot more big data available. I mean, basically, you could, for probably the first time in redistricting cycles, get access to data on people down to the individual level. Um, and it was combined with advances in computing power that really made it into a whole profession. So there grew up this group of outside consultants who redistricting was their job, they were experts on it, and they were technically skilled in doing it. So, um, and I've shown you here a picture of Maptitude for redistricting, which was the main software that most um, states used in redistricting in 2011. Um, and it is the software that really offered this new level of sophistication when it comes to redistricting. The second factor that made 2011 unique was there was a political escalation. Um, you know, so in 2011, I mean in 2010, Project Red Map was started. So Project Red Map was an initiative of the Republican State Leadership Committee. So basically that is the arm of the Republican Party that advocates for Republicans um, on the state legislative level, tries to get Republicans elected to state legislatures. Um, and they created this program specifically to increase Republican control of congressional seats by making sure they control the legislators that control redistricting. So Red Map spent around $30 million in total on state legislative races. And I think um, within the context of like national races, 30 million may not actually seem like a lot, but state legislative races are much cheaper to run. 30 million goes really far. So that's actually a huge investment. Um, and they ran this program in, in lots of swing states, including North Carolina, um, in an effort to capture state legislatures that would be redrawing maps in 2011 to make sure that they could um, make, so that they could make sure that those maps would advantage Republicans, especially in the US Congress. So it was really the first high level nationwide effort by a political party with the explicit goal of redrawing the maps for political advantage. So not just gaining seats to gain seats and to control policy, but specifically so that they would control the mapping process. Um, in North Carolina, the effort was led by Art Pope, um, you may have heard of him. He's a multimillionaire. He owns the Roses chain of stores, if, you have, if you're familiar with those. Um, and you can read more about him in this really great New Yorker article called State for Sale that I've linked here. Um, and this is the little caricature that they did of him for that article. So uh, what were the actual issues in the 2011 process. And obviously there were a lot, there were probably more than I could actually ever list, but I've broken them down into a few categories for the major things that we see as problems that happened in 2011. So first, 
only two people actually had total control over the whole process and operated without input from pretty much anyone else. Second, the maps were drawn um, out of public view by a consultant who had the explicit goal of gerrymandering for a Republican advantage. So they were drawn behind closed doors and no one had access to that person or his agenda or his methods other than maybe the two legislators who were in control of the process. So three, um, the maps themselves were built around extreme racial gerrymanders. So extreme racial gerrymanders were created and then the rest of the maps were drawn around those. And those extreme racial gerrymanders used the Voting Rights Act, something that's supposed to ensure ballot access and voting rights for minorities in order to draw extreme racial gerrymanders. Um, fourth, public input was not used to draw the maps, and it was not even really pop properly listened to by the legislature or anyone who was drawing the maps. Um, and it's also was inaccessible in the sense that unless you were at the public hearing, you would not really know what had been sent there unless perhaps you filed like a freedom of information type uh, request. So, um, and then fifth, the legislative process itself was very insubstantial and perfunctory. Maps were passed right through within days of their introduction with no real input from the committee and no real changes. So as a result of all these things, the maps themselves con contained um, racial gerrymanders and extreme partisan gerrymanders that have heavily skewed our elections in North Carolina. All right, so who was in charge of the process? So um, throughout this lesson, I'm going to be pulling a lot from different court filings because um, it's just one of the best ways to figure out what was actually going on at the time since so much was happening behind closed doors. Uh, but this is a filing from the North Carolina versus Covington case. And um, it says, from January 27th, 2011 until the first public pre presentation of a proposed map on June 17th, 2011, Senator Rucho and Representative Lewis were responsible for and determined for the Senate and House respectively, the persons who would design and build the proposed Senate and House maps, the criteria they would use in drawing the proposed maps, the process they would use and the timing of their work, and the security procedures that would be followed to keep the maps confidential. So basically this is just saying that Rucho and Lewis had complete control over this process really no one else had any input into the actual drawing of the maps or how the process was run in the legislature. So let's talk about who David Lewis is. I've already read you one of his quotes. I will read you another one of his quotes. Um, I think electing Republicans is better than electing Democrats, so I drew this map to help foster what I think is better for the country. So he thinks that Republic electing Republicans is better than electing Democrats, and he gets to decide that for you. So who is David Lewis? Um, David Lewis is one of the most consequential figures in North Carolina redistricting within the past 10 years and currently. He is still a current Republican member of the North Carolina State House of Representatives. He represents the 53rd district, which covers most of Harnett County. Um, he is still currently the senior chair of the House Redistricting Committee, just like he was in 2011. Um, I assume that if Republicans keep control of the state legislature or of the state house in 2021, he will continue to be the senior chair of the House Redistricting Committee. Um, and as such, he has more power than almost any other politician in North Carolina over how redistricting happens here. And as you've seen from the quotes that I've shown you, he's never really been all apologetic about his public position that he will do whatever he can to advance his Republican Party when drawing voting districts. That's really clear from all of his public statements. And if you'd like to get a little bit of a better idea about, you know, what his motivations were in his own words, um, he wrote an op-ed with Senator Ralph Heise, who is the current chair of the Senate Redistricting Committee, called um, we drew the congressional maps for partisan advantage that was the point this is an article um, this is an op-ed that was published in the atlantic that i've linked here so david um sorry bob rucho 
So here is probably Bob Rucho's most famous quote to also give you a perspective on who he is. Uh, I think this was actually a tweet. Justice Roberts Penn and Obamacare has done more damage to the USA than the swords of the Nazis, Soviets, and terrorists combined. Now, personally, as a Jewish person, I don't think that Obamacare can compare to the Nazis, but Bob Rucho does. So who is Bob Rucho? Um, he is a former North Carolina state senator, so he no longer serves, but he served from 20, 2008 to 2017 representing the 39th district, which covered parts of Mecklenburg County. Obviously, these districts have been redrawn a ton of times, so um, it's different now, but that is where he was from. And you probably recognize his name if you do, because he has been listed as a defendant in almost every gerrymandering lawsuit that has happened in North Carolina in the past decade. And he was a senior chair of the Senate Redistricting Committee from 2011 to 2016. So Rucho and Lewis were in control of the process, but who actually drew the maps, like physically drew them? And this is a question that you know if you've watched um, our previous lesson on the North Carolina redistricting process that I'm really fixated on because, you know, the legislators that control the process, it's good to know who they are, but they're public figures. Who's physically drawing the maps is really important too. So again, from North Carolina v. Covington, um, a complaint. Dr. Thomas Brooks Hoffler was retained by the law firm Ogletree Deacons to design and draw the Senate and House plans for Senator Rucho and Representative Lewis. He began working for Senator Rucho and Representative Lewis in December of 2010 and began drawing plans in March 2011 following the receipt of new census data. Senator Rucho described Hoffler as the chief architect of the plans and Hoffler described himself the same way. So this Dr. Thomas Brooks Hoffler was the person who was retained to actually draw the maps. Um, and again, here's a quote from Hoffler to give you a sense of his attitude towards redistricting. Redistricting is like an election in reverse. It's a great event. Usually the voters get to pick the politicians. In redistricting, the politicians get to pick the voters. All right. So who was Hoffler? Um, Hoffler was a Republican political strategist who's primarily known for his extensive involvement in gerrymandering redistricting maps across the country in favor of Republicans. He started all the way back in the 1970s trying to um, initiate this change where redistricting would become computerized rather than something that was done by hand. Um, he's also someone who started um, who kind of originated the idea of using the Voting Rights Act, again, something that was set up to enable minority voters to access the ballot and also to be able to elect candidates of their choice. He's the one who really originated the idea of trying to use that act to justify packing Black voters into majority Black districts to reduce their influence. Um, he also was a big advocate of secrecy around redistricting. He would only ever take oral instructions from the legislators he was working for to make sure there was no paper trail that could be used in court. Um, he was basically obsessed with secrecy. After his death, however, um, in 2018, a lot of his files were found, and it was shown that he was behind, actually, the Trump administration attempt to add a citizenship question to our federal census. Um, and he tried to do this because he felt the data would make it possible to draw districts that would be advantageous to Republicans and non-Hispanic whites. So, Hoffler in North Carolina. Hoffler was involved in every redistricting, regular or court order, that happened in North Carolina from 2010 up to his death in 2018. Some of the files that um, were made public during the Common Cause versus Lewis case show us a little bit about how he did this. So this is a screenshot um, from one of his uh, map drawing files in Maptitude, that program that I already showed you a, a different screenshot of. And what I've circled here is you can see this column that's titled percent 18 plus AP black. And that is the percentage of black voting age people in the district that he was drawing. So he was sorting his districts by how many um, black voting age people there were in them. So clearly he was very focused on 
using race as a factor in his decisions for how to draw districts. And interestingly enough, this is a map that comes from a remedial process he was involved in that the legislature at the time said did not involve racial data at all. But here it is in his files. Um, here's another screenshot of his um, from the same case where you see basically what he's done is he's broken down all his districts and he's color coded and ranked them by the average Republican election result and then the specific Republican election result in the 2014 Senate race. So you can see he's super fixated on, um, you know, making sure he knows what the partisan result is going to be down to a very granular level in his districts and making decisions about them that way. Um, and here's one last screenshot from his files uh, where he's basically done the same thing, but he's taken, I think these are precincts and um, color coded them by their partisan lead. All right, so Hoffler is drawing the districts. What are some of the things that he does? Um, the first thing that uh, he does, I think the most controversial thing that he does is what I'm calling the so-called VRA districts. Um, so here is something again pulled from the North Carolina versus Covington complaint. Um, during the process, Senator Rucho and Representative Lewis told Hoffler, draw a 50% plus one district wherever in the state there is a sufficiently compact black population to do so. So basically, he was told by Rucho and Lewis, we want you to draw a majority black district everywhere you possibly can. Anywhere where the population is remotely compact enough to do so, you should do so. So these quote-unquote VRA districts were the first legislative districts to actually be filed in the form of a bill as sort of like completed districts, and Hoffler created them by following this instruction. So he was drawing as many districts as he possibly could with more than 15% of black voting age population, so which is often in redistricting terms called BVAP. Um, so here you can see the Senate quote unquote VRA districts that he drew. And then on this slide, you can see the House quote unquote VRA districts that he drew. So at the time, um, Rucho and Lewis insisted that these districts had to be drawn with more than 50% uh, BVAP to comply with the Voting Rights Act. So the Voting Rights Act provides for the drawing of majority minority districts in order to allow minority groups to elect a candidate of their choice. However, if you want to draw a majority minority district under the VRA, under most under legal precedent, you have to subject the area that you want to draw that district in to a three-point test. Basically, you have to show that there is a sufficient minority population to draw a majority minority district in the first place. You have to show that that minority population tends to vote as a block. And you also have to show that there is racially polarized voting, that basically, for instance, black voters and white voters always vote or consistently vote for different candidates. So that a majority white district would always elect someone who was not the choice of black voters in that area. And that's something that Rucho and Lewis and Hoffler never showed. They never did that analysis. That is the analysis that the Supreme Court has said you need to show when you are drawing a district like this in order to justify these districts that they drew. They just drew as many majority black districts as they possibly could without actually seeing whether or not they were necessary. So at the time, um, Senator Dan Blue, who represents um, the southeast part of Raleigh, said, I think that they, these districts, unnecessarily and probably illegally pack minority voters into districts. So there were a lot of objections to these districts at the time from legislators. Um, a lot of members of the General Assembly, a lot of black members of the General Assembly, um, were concerned that they didn't think that this um, drawing these majority black districts was necessary to um, let minority voters ch choose, let elect a candidate of their choice. Um, they th thought that this was, um, you know, obviously defying these requirements for this kind of analysis that was supposed to be done. And basically the response they got from Rachel Lewis was that 
Um, they felt that they were just following the law and this is what they needed to do. Otherwise, they were afraid they were going to get sued under a Section 2 of the VRA, which covers these majority minority districts. Um, obviously, an assertion that I think is contrary to any conventional legal analysis of what the VRA actually calls for. And when these districts were later challenged in court, the court agreed. So this is the opinion from the court in the North Carolina versus Covington case. After careful consideration of the evidence presented, we conclude that race was a predominant factor motivating the drawing of all the challenged districts. Moreover, defendants have not shown that their use of race to draw any of these districts was narrowly tailored to further a compelling state interest. So the state might have an interest in allowing minority voters to elect a candidate of their choice, but Rucho and Luce had never made the effort to show that that was necessary, that it was necessary to draw these majority minority districts in order to allow black voters to elect a candidate of their choice. They just drew them, presumably, um, you know, knowing Hoffler's record, there this caused packing of black voters and, and a reduction of their influence. All right, so public hearings versus actual public input. So there were two rounds of public hearings during the 2011 process. Um, the first process happened before maps were officially submitted by legislators um, in April and early May, but well after Hoffler had begun his work. Because if you remember, Hoffler had started working for Richo and Lewis back in December of 2010 and had been drawing maps since getting access to census data in March. Um, there was also a second round of public hearings that happened in late June and July um, after Lewis and Richo had filed an initial group of proposed maps. There's no record of whether any of the statements that were made at the public hearings were used by Hoffler or Rucho or Lewis in any way in the drawing of the maps that were subsequently enacted. And here, this is just a map of where the public hearings were. Um, the red dots are at where the hearing locations were. And then the yellow, um, the counties that are colored in yellow are counties where there were the so-called quote unquote VRA districts. And um, you can see that, uh, you know, there's maybe decent coverage, but I can see, you know, like you know already, I grew up in Moore County, and in that area, there's just this big blank spot all the way west to Union County. There's just no sites there. So, not great. All right. Public input. So, um, here are a couple quotes about, you know, public input and how it was maybe used or not used. So from um, this great article by Van Newkirk in The Atlantic called How Redistricting Became a Technological Arms Race, um, in North Carolina at least, constituents reported that map makers in the General Assembly shifted around map making feedback sessions or simply ignored comment from outraged citizens. And then from a complaint in a different re uh, redistricting case, Harris versus McCrory, it says, Mr. Hoffler did not attend any public hearings on redistricting in North Carolina or review transcripts of those hearings. So logically, if Hoffler is the one who's doing all the map drawing and he never listens to any public comment or looks at any of the transcripts of public comment that were created, then how could the maps he drew ever reflect public comment that he never listened to? Um, Here's a case study of sort of a specific case of where public input um, and how it was reacted to by Rucho and Lewis. So there were actually specific public hearings held just on the quote unquote VRA districts um, in Wake, Cumberland, Guilford, Mecklenburg, New Hanover, Pitt, and Hertford counties. Those actually aren't all the counties that had quote unquote VRA districts in them. So, you know, take that as you will. So from the, um, again, from the North Carolina versus Covington case um, in the plaintiff's trial brief, it says, citizens from around the state testified at public hearings that the districts went beyond what was required for compliance in the v with the VRA. So basically, a lot of people showed up to these specific public hearings on the quote unquote VRA districts and said, 
Uh, we don't think these are appropriate to actually meeting minority voter needs. We think these go up beyond what the VRA actually calls for. So there was a lot of objection to these districts in the public comment. So in response, Rucho and Lewis basically held a press conference and made a public statement and said, um, no, we're not trying to pack black voters. Um, and we think that this is legal and this is our legal ob obligation. And so basically they didn't listen to anything that any of the public had said. I think, you know, even if you had felt legally justified, which I don't believe that they were in drawing districts like this, if you have all of the people in those areas coming to the public hearings and saying, we don't think this is appropriate, we don't think it's necessary, you think that you would say, hmm, the people in this area actually have some pretty strong objections. Maybe we should reconsider these districts. But instead, Rucho and Lewis basically stonewalled and said that they believe that they were doing the right thing legally and, you know, public comment be damned. All right, so now the actual process, which is going to be short because the process was very short. So Rucho and Lewis were in control of the process. That's something we've already established. And they were really in control of the process. So they conducted all of the actual substantive work and made all of the actual substantive decisions without the aid, advice, or approval of the redistricting committees or any other legislators. They were basically working completely independently. Um, the most I could find is that apparently they kept their leadership, so they kept the um, Phil Berger, the um, president of the Senate and the Speaker of the House at the time, Tom Tillis, who's our current senator, um, they kept them apprised of what they were doing, but they didn't even ask them for advice or input. They were just going it completely alone. They were doing everything independently on their own. Um, and this is stuff that this is um, this comes out of the plaintiff's trial brief in North Carolina versus Covington, and they are making these statements on the basis of depositions that they've taken of Rucho and Luke. So the committees are basically powerless. Um, there were a few committee meetings. So I think there were was one joint Senate and House redistricting committee meeting on March 30th, and then maybe another one on June 15th. Um, and the House redistricting committee had like one other separate meeting on April 7th. But at none of those meetings did the committee discuss criteria that would be used to draw the maps. They did not decide on criteria that would be used to draw the maps. They did not hear anything about Hoffler, what instructions he was given, what he was doing. They were not shown any of Hoffler's work product at any of those meetings. Basically, the committees were completely in the dark. So all of these other legislators who've been appointed to these committees presumably to participate in the process and have input and, and represent their constituents, were kept completely in the dark. They had no input on how the maps were drawn. They knew nothing about what Hoffler was doing, and they didn't even get to see the work that he did until Rucho and Lewis felt that it was complete enough to present as a fully proposed map. Um, and here's just a little picture on the bottom of the committee room where a lot of this, these committee meetings were held. Um, hopefully I will see you there in 2021 because that is where it will still be happening. So the timeline for the actual passage of the final version of the maps was really, really rapid. So both um, the full maps were introduced to both committees, so the Senate and the House committees, and passed through both houses in less than a week. So the whole process took place from about July 21st to July 27th. Um, there were no amendments to the Senate map passed during this process, and there was only one amendment to the House map, which made some very, very small changes to two districts. And when I say small, it took me forever just trying to look at both maps and compare them, the before and the after, to even see that any changes had been made. So very minor changes. Um, and to give you an idea of the actual work schedule that went on, um, the Senate Bill 455, which was the bill that had the Senate legislative map in it, this was the timeline. Um, the map passed through the Senate Redistricting Committee on the 23rd, July the 23rd. On July the 25th, the, all the proposed amendments failed in floor vote. 
on the Senate floor. It passed the Senate floor, and then it was referred to the House Redistricting Committee. And then on the 27th, it passed the House Redistricting Committee and passed the House, House floor. So um, within those three days of work, it was completely done and gone and passed through. So, you know, obviously, probably in those off days on the 24th and on the 26th, there were some discussions happening about it. But really, I mean, such in a short timeline, really no, clearly no opportunity for discussion. And the fact that there were no amendments means that there was zero compromise. Basically, Rucho and Lewis got the map that they wanted passed through with almost no edits. So now let's talk about the maps themselves that were a result of this very abbreviated process controlled by two men. So um, again, I'm quoting from um, this Van Newkirk article in The Atlantic, which is drawing upon um, a filing in the Dixon v. Rucho case, which was another um, gerrymandering case in North Carolina. So this says, the Dixon and V. Rocho plaintiffs alleged that the three plans divide the 563, five, divide 563 of the state's 2,692 precincts into more than 1,400 sections. So 563 precincts end up being cut into 1,400 sections. That's just frankly ridiculous. And so here are some of the scenarios that resulted from that kind of um, map drawing. Residents of one and a half blocks of a small neighborhood street will receive three different ballot styles for the 2012 federal ele election. So basically, one and a half blocks of a neighborhood are divided into three different districts. Um, in another precinct, over the course of an election cycle, 18 different sets of ballots would have to be printed. So that's extreme and unreasonable. And here you can see the fi uh, um, final legislative maps. On the previous slide, there was the final congressional map, and this is the final legislative maps. So on the top, you see the Senate, and on the bottom, you see the House, and you can kind of see, I'm looking especially like at the top in the Senate map, how there's just this weird arm that reaches into Cumberland County. It's kind of strange looking. Um, and you can get a good closer look at these when I upload the PDFs, but, um, uh, and I will upload the PDFs and sources as well. Uh, just, uh, just on its face of it, these maps look strange. So the real result was that, you know, these maps ended up getting redrawn. So the 2011 congressional maps were redrawn in 2016 under court order in the Cooper v. Harris case after they were found to be racially gerrymandered. And you can see on the bottom, I've taken a picture here, these are the these are the two districts that were targeted as being racial gerrymanders. Um, the 12th congressional districts, which you can see, basically stretches up Highway 85 from Charlotte to Greensboro, which is just strange in and of itself. And then the first congressional district, which, again, you know, is this kind of monster that's been created to, to reach out and grab different um, majority black communities. So that was determined to be racially gerrymandered. And then the 2011 state legislative maps were redrawn in 2017 under court order in the North Carolina versus Covington case. And which, from what you've seen a lot of um, excerpts from some of the filings in this lesson, after they were also found to be racially gerrymandered. And the remedial maps that were drawn under court order in both of these cases were again redrawn in 2019 when the remedial maps were found to contain partisan gerrymanders. And if you don't think that the 2011 maps were partisan gerrymandered and the 2016 and 17 maps were, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. All right, so key takeaways. So what are the takeaways that we, you know, what, are, what can we learn from the 2011 process? First, 2011 was the start of a new era of gerrymandering, right? It was a new era of gerrymandering in the sense that it was technologically sophisticated and it was also a political target in an explicit way that it hadn't been before. And this is something that is going to continue and escalate in 2021. This is not going to change. So we need to be aware of that. Second, the lack of transparency is what enabled Rucho and Lewis to do what they did. So the fact that they could communicate with Hoffler 
only orally, the fact that Hoffler was allowed to draw the maps um, by himself in his private home without the public having any access to that, the fact that Hoffler was not required to submit any kind of public report explaining what he had done or what data he had used or what algorithms he had created, um, the fact that, you know, the public did not have early access to any of these maps. Basically, the lack of transparency for me is the number one thing that allows this kind of extreme gerrymandering to happen. Because if we had been able to see what Hoffler was doing, um, if we had had a report from him that was documenting his reasoning for everything, it would have been a lot easier to raise public objections and to forestall some of the things that happened. But since all of this was happening behind closed doors and orally with no paper trail, uh, it made it really difficult for the public to engage in the process in a meaningful way. So uh, to me, this means that fighting for transparency has to be one of our top priorities for next year. Third, uh, Hoffler himself passed away in 2018 but there are plenty more people like him out there. This has become an industry with lots of specialists and his successors are waiting in the wings. So we really need to advocate against letting people who are clear political operatives with partisan motivations be the ones to draw the maps. We should not let the legislature hire people like that. That's not to say that consultants can't be helpful. Um, I think that there are people like, if you follow redistricting, Nathan Persley is an academic who's been involved as a special master in a lot of cases. He was a special master hired by a court to redraw um, maps in North Carolina in a um, you know nonpartisan and competitive way. Um, you know there are people out there who are nonpartisan and in. in could possibly be helpful, but there are a lot of political operatives too, and we need to be really aware that like the process cannot be turned over to people who have those kinds of partisan motivations. Fourth, um, people who want to gerrymander maps will use every trick to justify and obfuscate what they're doing. They will try to cover up the fact that they are drawing districts for political advantage however they can, including lying about what the VRA says. I don't think that this is going away. I think that we will see this again in 2021. I think that there will be an effort to say that districts are drawn to be in compliance with the VRA when the real object is really to pack black voters and reduce their influence. We can't let people, those people shape the narrative. We can't let that become the dominant way these things are. I mean, honestly, I'm really offended by the fact that it is typical to call the quote unquote VRA districts that were drawn in 2011 the VRA districts because they really have nothing to do with the Voting Rights Act. They are not a true representation of what that act tries to do for minority voters. But Rucho and Lewis captured that narrative and that's what they called it. And so that's what we ended up calling them. We can't let that happen again. Fifth, Rucho, Lewis, and Hoffler didn't listen to public input, but other people did. So Rucho and Lewis, clearly, if they were at public hearings, they didn't care what was said there. Hoffler wasn't even at them. He never looked at transcripts. He never used any public input. That's just the truth. But other people did. So I think this comes out in two ways. First of all, if more people are empowered in the process, if more legislators are included in the process, there's more points to attack with public input. So. You know, if Rucho and Lewis are the only people controlling the process, they really don't have to listen to anyone. They sit in super safe districts. They're fine. But if all of the legislators on the redistricting committee or all the legislators in the General Assembly are there to listen to public input and have power to help draw the maps, they're going to be more incentivized to listen to public input. So we really need to, that's why we need to increase transparency as well. We need to make sure that there are more openings for other legislators who can be influenced by public input to have a part in the process. Secondly, public input was used as evidence in a lot of the successful court cases that happened after 2011 that overturned a lot of these gerrymandered districts. Um, and so it was really important that the public input that was given was smart, and specific and incisive. And I feel the same way about the public input in 2021. It really needs to be geographically focused, very strategic, very thoughtful. 
um, and a true representation of the communities that it is about. So um, that's, you know, my hobby horse about public input. You've heard me say that before, but I think that that is really apparent from what we see in the 2011 process. Six, Rucho and Lewis fast-tracked the process to make sure that no one had time to question their accent, actions. And we need to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And one of the ways we can do that is pushing on legislators and making sure that they are not standing by and being victims of this rush process, that they are not just going along to get along and not wanting to make waves, that they feel pressure from their constituents to be active participants and to actively question what is happening. So along those lines, um, if you watched the last lesson, you've seen this before, but again, I've put up an assignment to help you start to build a relationship with your legislator. It's really one of the most impactful things that you can do if you contact them now, if you, if you let them know that you are passionate about fair maps now and you consistently stay in touch with them, they will know you once we get to 2021. They will be aware that you are a super engaged constituent and they will be more incentivized to listen to you because they have a relationship with you. So um, this assignment is already up in unit one. Um, it has a way of um, a reference to a website that will help you find out who your legislators are if you don't know them and how to contact them. And it also has a template uh, letter that you can use to send an email to them about what you expect to see from them on redistricting in 2021. Um, and I will say a couple of people have already um, submitted those letters and they have been frankly amazing. I am so impressed by what you all can do and like how smart you all are already about this process and how passionate you are about staying on top of your legislators. So um, that makes me really happy and I would love to see more of you be able to do that. So the assignment is there to help you and I hope that you can take advantage of that. All right, so this is the last lesson in unit one. Unit one is done, you've finished. If you've gone through all the lessons, like congratulations, you've already learned a ton. Um, and I've learned a ton doing this with you. So unit one is over, unit two will start next, and unit two is going to cover North Carolina redistricting history. And um, when I say North Carolina redistricting history, we mostly mean North Carolina litigation history because the history of redistricting in North Carolina really revolves a lot around important court cases. And so that is mostly what we will be spending our time on is the important court cases that shaped what our redistricting process is today. All right, again, thank you so much for joining me for this lesson. It was a super deep dive. It was really intense and nerdy, and I hope that you enjoyed it. I enjoyed doing it. I enjoyed putting it together for you. Um, and I hope to see you again soon. All right, I will talk to you later.